Okay, let me see here. So I just launched it. Um, let me go into Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, let me get the information here. What have you got for a meeting ID? send this over again. Did. Did you not get it? Oh, right. Forget that one. I f I'm sorry. I didn't send you the panelist one. I sent you the the one for the participants. Um, I'm trying to find... I'm trying to find the email that I sent you yesterday. I can't find it. Maybe it's buried in this string. Oh, because it got sent from from Zoom. Webinars. I'm I'm in. I, I started the meeting already. Panelists is on. Invitations, invite panelists. I'm going to resend you the panelist one, okay? My guess is you've got, you might have to clear your cache. You know, in your computer, sometimes it just, you know, you get, uh, 
you, you get uh, an address that's stuck in there every time you go to Zoom, it just automatically takes you back to the to a spot. So you might have to clear your cache. Yeah, if I can figure out how to do that, I'm not sure I know how to do it, but I'm, I'll work on it. Yeah, I mean, it's 20 after. I would think that he'd be in by now. Do you want to call him and find out? Yeah. Hold on a second, I'll try. Up, oh, Kit's in. He just joined. Okay, so he's in. Hey, Kit. Hello. How are you this morning? Very good. Good. Hey, um, could you do me a favor? Could you forward the link that you just logged into to uh, to Scott? Okay. He's having trouble getting in. I'll do that. Thank you. He's got a new email address, doesn't he? Yeah, it's it's scurrent at uh, mchi or something like that. <laughs> Thanks. I, <found laughs> it. I got it. <laughs> 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 it's, it's got a bunch of letters and an at symbol. You'll figure it out. I think he got it. He should have gotten it. I just said I forwarded it. <laughs> I think we're all set. I did add a couple of videos. Scott wanted that video of me throwing out a pitch. So I took the, I downloaded uh, or uploaded whatever on the YouTube, the video that he took of me throwing the pitch. So that'll be towards the beginning. And then there's a couple other videos in there, so I'll, I'll make sure. I would like to check the sound on a couple, if we could do that. Yeah, sure. You want to go for it now? Yeah, if we could. Okay. Let's see, host disabled attendee screen sharing, so I can't do it yet. Well, that would be helpful. Yeah. All panelists. There we go. Here we go. Oh, there's Scott. You're coming in. Okay. I'm going to hang up. You're going to hang up? On Scott. I was on the other line with him. Oh. <laughs> okay. It's confusing. Working with me isn't easy, Kit. You're no, earning no, your no, money today, fine. man. It usually turns <laughs> out just fine. Let's see. We're going to have one. Here we go. But, but what it doesn't, it does, it's really a bomb. I understand that if you have earbuds in, this is louder than it needs to be, so. Hi, this is Kit Welchlin, and welcome to Welchlin.com. How's that sound? Good. That Not too good. loud? Yeah, yeah. That sound, no, that's perfect. Perfect. Oh, wow, perfect's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna go back, make sure we have the first slide teed up. And Hale, what I'm going to do is, I'll kick it off. I'll say that we have three panelists, and then I'll say that we have some uh, housekeeping items. We're going to record this session, and we'll post it. And I said we'll monitor the chat session. So you know, please post your questions, and have fun and engage. And I'm going to turn it over to Hale to kind of do a review of the past year and some of the future events that we have planned. And then you'll do that, and then you'll turn it back to me, and I'll introduce Kit. 
Okay. Dude, like, my lighting keeps changing this morning. <laughs> I'm either kind of shiny or get kind of dark, so. Ten different lights in here to try and make this work. I think that worked out all right. Does it look okay? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not, do you have any makeup put on? No. <laughs> no, I don't. We got one attendee in. Seven minutes till showtime till we drop the flags, release the hounds, and sound the trumpets. Is everybody muted to this point, Hale? All the uh, participants are muted, yes, but they okay. can use uh, chat to communicate with us. Have you started recording already? Well, yeah, but then I just, you know, edit the recording once. Uh, once we're done, so the people, if they want to view it after the, they just, you know, I started, the saved recording will be starting when, you know, the actual thing starts and ends. Okay, so it sounds like you got a process. <laughs> okay, I'm going to, I'm going to mute and uh, get off the camera so you guys can do all your housekeeping and announcements and then when in, you start to introduce me, I'll get involved. Fair enough. Sounds like a plan. Thanks, okay. Kit. Yep. I had two of my pets in my office heckling me, so I had to kick them out. Is that a coffee machine, Hale, that I hear? <laughs> That's me writing, actually. 
trying to jot, jot down yeah. the yeah. notes about the upcoming events. Already missed you guys. I had to come back. <laughs> we, we missed you as well. <laughs> it was the longest two minutes of my life. <laughs> I'm leaving again. <laughs> <laughs> Hale, do we want to let people know that uh, we'll get started here? Yeah, we've got uh, people are just starting to to uh, to trickle into the uh, into the meeting here. So we're uh, we're two minutes from uh, start time, and uh, uh, so we'll probably give uh, an extra three or four minutes here before we uh, before we actually get started and. Uh, allow people to uh, kind of go through that two-step process of registering for uh, the Zoom meeting and then uh, getting the email and then finally logging into the Zoom meeting if uh, people, generally speaking, are not, uh, not going to start the process until right at 8.30. Yeah, do, we, do we want people to use the Q&A or the chat? Um, I think the chat is best, but I will be able to monitor either one. So if anybody okay. uh, monitor, anybody uh, does select on the Q&A, that's fine. Um, but the chat, I think, is just easier. I'd like on the chat if they type in their questions in capital letters so we recognize it's a question for us instead of just chit-chat with each other. Perfect. All caps. Like they're yelling at you, Kit. You're muted. Thanks for joining everyone. We're going to be uh, just about two more minutes as people uh, continue to uh, come into the meeting.
Doris, to answer your question, um, you are you are muted automatically. So thanks for asking. But everybody that is a participant is uh, is automatically muted. But if you have questions, uh, please don't hesitate to use the uh, the Q and A or the chat. Uh, Scott and I will both be monitoring uh, those uh, so that um, we can get those questions to Kit uh, either during or uh, towards the end of the uh, presentation. Okay, well, we're still adding folks, but I think it's 8.33. So uh, for the courtesy of the folks that, uh, that are in, uh, why don't, uh, Scott, why don't you kick us off? All right. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we have an exciting program this morning, embracing the changes caused by COVID in the contact center. I hope everyone's well and safe and your families are doing the same. We have Kit Welshland teed up today, always an exciting speaker. Um, joining you today is myself, Scott Current from Current Connections. We have Hale J from Contact Center uh, Consulting Group, and then of course Kit. Just a couple of housekeeping items. We will record this session and make it available on our website, uh, so we will post it. Uh, we'll monitor the chats and the Q and A. Uh, if you would type your questions in the Q&A in capital letters so Kit can read them and we can read them. That would be great. Um, uh, just to kind of helps us distinguish uh, general conversations from the actual questions. And uh, have fun and engage. If you've seen Kit speak before, you know that he's uh, highly energetic, fun, and, uh, you know, quite the intellectual. So hoping you get some great insights from today. So before we introduce Kit, I want to turn it over to Hale to do a review of some of the things we've done in the past year, this year. As you know, everything's pretty much been virtual and what we have planned for the future. So take it away, Hale. Absolutely. Well, thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. Um, as you know, uh, everything that the Midwest Contact Center Association is doing is, uh, is virtual and we're continuing to uh, come up with, you know, the, the best ways possible that we can add value uh, to our uh, contact center partners uh, that are out there. Um, uh, obviously, we're, um, we're always trying to uh, present best practices uh, and um, give you an environment where you can uh, not only learn, but also collaborate with other call centers. And that's really been one of the biggest initiatives that we're trying to take on right now is we're putting together some uh, small groups of, of folks to, to be able to meet online uh, and really uh, just chat in a, in, a, in a safe environment where you're not necessarily competing against other call centers or, or, or other folks. But it's great. It's always great to be able to hear from other practitioners, um, kind of their pre-COVID story, their COVID story, and then what, what they're really looking at and, and what those biggest challenges are that they're facing. Um, because you may have faced some of those same challenges before and already solved them, or you may have the exact same questions that they do and somebody in the room can, uh, can be helpful and help out. So um, we're putting together uh, executive uh, leadership roundtables. We're putting together practitioner roundtables so, uh, so that you can do that. So you'll start to see some of those opportunities um, posted online. Uh, the Chicago has a uh, an executive uh, leadership roundtable that's right now that's posted for October one. Uh, so you know, in those groups, we're kind of looking for you know ten to twelve people in a room, and then we'll moderate the discussion. Uh, but we're not there to uh, necessarily present, um, but we'll certainly help uh, help lead the conversation uh, amongst uh, amongst the group. Um, also on October 14th coming up, um, we have a kind of a holistic uh, uh, look at the contact center uh, where Eric Berg will be speaking and he's one of the board members and he'll be uh, talking about, you know, understanding the impact of working from home uh, across all the different kind of workflows uh, that happen within the organization. And so not just this, uh, 
you know, the, the call cues and uh, the agent cues, but really looking at everything that needs to happen, all those workflows and how you can kind of help to, to tie those things together. Uh, then on November the 5th, uh, Rick Kasiba is going to be our speaker. Uh, Rick is, uh, is one of those speakers that you, that you see at all the trade shows uh, across the country. Um, and he, uh, he really helps uh, put, you know, companies put, to, put together data-driven plans uh, to help uh, agent performance. And he's going to talk about uh, some of the best uh, tips and tricks uh, that are available out there to really help you uh, engage uh, your agents and also uh, help to, you know, to, to really increase uh, productivity and, and help, uh, you know, both from an engagement standpoint and a productivity standpoint. And then in the first quarter, uh, Brad Cleveland is going to be joining us uh, and we're going to be having a, a great uh, conversation with Brad, who's pretty much written, you know, the Bible on uh, all things contact center related. So uh, that, that'll be a lot of fun to, to have him join us. So um, with that, uh, Scott, why don't you uh, introduce um, uh, Kit and maybe uh, just reiterate the, uh, the chat feature and, and asking uh, questions. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Absolutely. Thanks, Hale. Yeah, just to emphasize, your membership is very important to us, and we appreciate your participation in all of our events, and hopefully you see some of the work that we've done in bringing new events in the future. Hopefully we can meet face-to-face -face in the near future. So Kit Welshland, if you haven't heard Kit speak, you're in for a lot of fun today, and uh, you'll come away with some, some great uh, knowledge and things that you can put in play, hopefully in your personal life and professionally. So Kit, uh, born and raised in St. James, Minnesota, uh, he began speaking, we're really not sure when he began to speak, but uh, we know public speaking, he decided to get in front of people and speak at the age of nine. He uh, bought his first uh, manufacturing company at 21, went on to uh, buy three more and be you know the CEO and chairman of the board so he has solid business experience uh, and he continues to be involved also emphasizing that he has his uh, master's or not his uh, master's in business administration and, and speech communication but kid is a keynote speaker a national keynote speaker seminar leader author uh, and a member of the National Speaking Association He's also been inducted into the Hall of Fame of the National Speakers Association in 2014. He's delivered, you know, 3,500 to 4,000 speeches. I lose track. I don't know if he keeps track, but it's over, you know, uh, 500,000 people he's talked to. And uh, today it looks like he's going to add another 35, 40 people to his uh, talking list. But the most important thing I think today is. Uh, you know, looking back to when we all got together in the fall and we had this wonderful events at the Twins uh, games. And one of those games, Kit was selected to throw out the first pitch. And I happened to be drinking a beer with, with Kit and we were socializing on the deck, eating some popcorn. And all of a sudden, one of the, one of the Twins uh, associates come up and they said, it's time to go down. And Kit said, what, now? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm ready. So we walked down and they brought us through the Twin Stadium and down through uh, the lower level. And we walked past the Yankee Stadium and I think it started to kick in. It's like, there's the Yankees. <laughs> the Yankees showed up today. And we walked out onto the field and there's TC Bear and TC Bear you know, was there and some of the people explained, all right, now you're going to go out on that mound and you're going to throw a pitch and, you know, just try to get it as close to the plate as you possibly can. And Kit's looking at me going, it looks so far away. <laughs> I'm not sure I practiced appropriately. But Kit went out and he walked right up and I have to say he nailed it. Uh, to me, it looked like a sinker you know, that dropped as soon as it hit the plate, it lost philosophy. But Kit's going to play a little video before he jumps in today. And uh, you all can make your judge of what type of pitch it was. I thought he did a, he did one heck of a job. But uh, after he finished up and T.C. Bear high-fived him and 
we uh, were escorted out. We walked past the uh, Yankee Stadium and our Yankees dugout uh, and uh, locker room, and we talked a little trash. I'm not. I'm pretty sure they didn't hear us, but in our minds, we were talking trash going past them. And I think that's really what threw the game. We ended up winning with a victory over the Yankees that day, all because Kit threw out that first pitch. I'm certain of that. <laughs> so good job, Kit. Why don't you show us uh, what that looked like that day? Okay, let's take a look. Thank you. It's it's always exciting and interesting when you introduce me. I never quite know <laughs> what you're going to say. <laughs> oh, let's see, I should be able to get this to pop up. Oh my goodness, we did a practice and here I'm struggling. Okay, sure. Stop sharing. Let's try this one more time. Let's see if I can get this thing to fire up. Should be able to see my slides here shortly. Yep. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for that, that introduction. Yeah, you know, I grew up on a hog and dairy farm, and the reason I began public speaking at the age of nine was because I grew up in a position-centered family, not a person-centered family where everyone would have an equal say or an equal vote, but there was a true hierarchy in the family where my dad had the most authority than my mom, and then it went from oldest to youngest, and I was the youngest. So what would happen around the dining room table is my dad would say something, then my mom would say something, then Cabot, Kelly, Corey, and then they changed the subject. And I always had a terrible time getting into a conversation. But in 4-H, I could get up in front of a club once a month and give a five or 10 minute speech without inter introduction and uh, or interruption. I haven't stopped since. And so today we're gonna to be spending about an hour together and then have some time for question and answers at the very end. But uh, let's take a look at Scott's story about the opportunity I had through your association from you being on the bud deck for me to throw out that first pitch. And that happened to be on September 11th, 2018, the Twins against the Yankees. There's Scott and me down there right before they're going to send me out to the mound. Scott, you kind of remind me of Benjamin Buttons. It seems like every time I, we get a photograph of you, you look younger. But here's some video proof that Scott shot this. So this hasn't been altered. It's a uh, raw footage. And let's see. Yeah, there, T.C. Bear walked by, patted him on the back. I needed him to be good on the glove. There's a reassuring nod from the Twins representative. They just mentioned your association. There's proof. There's proof that it actually happened. And uh, it's one of the highlights. It was great to be chosen. It was nice that you folks uh, suggested me. So uh, I did throw, though, uh, I went down to Dick's Sporting Goods. I bought a bag of six baseballs. And for two months, I threw 50 balls a day across the street at the park. So I threw about 3,000 pitches to throw that one pitch. And uh, I'm glad I did, because when I first uh, started throwing pitches, I didn't realize how stiff I was and how I didn't really have a follow through and the ball was everywhere. So a little bit of effort always pays off, it seems like. Well, today we're going to be talking about change and coping with change. And there's three key drivers of change, technology, information, and people. And when it comes to technology, it's said that well over 80% of the world's technological advances have occurred since 1900. The first practical industrial robot was introduced in the 1960s. By 1982, there are about 32,000 robots being used, today 20 million. Now, when I was in manufacturing in the 80s, we used to have a rule in the industry that I was in that you would not invest in automated equipment or robotics unless that machine would replace at least seven jobs. If you weren't going to get that kind of a return, just keep paying the payroll because by the time you got the capital investment back, the technology would have changed. Now, if we use that old multiplier and it's much higher today than it was in the 1980s, seven jobs for every robot, 20 million robots, that's 140 million jobs that have been replaced through technology. That's about as many full-time jobs as that exist in this country. Then when it comes to information, more information has been produced in the last 30 years than the previous 5,000 years. 
A weekday edition of the New York Times contains as much information as a person was likely to come across in a lifetime in 17th century England. Now, I always like to test statistics, so I picked up a 13-week subscription to the New York Times. There's more information in there than you need to know in a lifetime, but because technology can pump it out, they think people are probably going to read it. And of course, they will. So people, a lot of people, it took 7 million years to get a billion people on the face of the earth, another 130 years to get to 6 billion, and somewhere around 2040, 2050 or so, uh, there's gonna be about 10 billion people standing around looking at each other. So more knowledge, reaching more people, faster, more change. So I wanna share with you the different industries I work with so you don't feel like you've been singled out. But the difference this time versus uh, other changes I've dealt with with other industries is how quick this one happened. Now, I work with the construction industry quite a bit and I came across this article and it's about how they can build 3D, they can build houses now with 3D printers, about 600 square feet for about $10,000 and in about 48 hours. And now they are putting together the equipment that would be on a single semi-trailer that could build a, a home up to 2,500 square feet with a 3D printer. So the construction industry might be seeing that coming. And then you've heard about these Amazon, Amazon Go stores where you walk in and it scans your phone and then Whatever you pull off the shelves, there's cameras and sensors that record that. And when you leave, it just builds the credit card you have attached to your phone. Uh, so I know that when I first had noticed that you could check out your own groceries and or at Walmart, you could check out your own goods. I really wasn't that interested in it. And then all of a sudden I tried it a couple of times. And well, I think the 3.5 million people that make their living as cashiers might be a little bit concerned about that. But you know, we kind of see it coming. And then uh, I do quite a bit of work in healthcare. And about four years ago, I was speaking at a chief information officer conference in Denver. And a person from Google Biomedical had mentioned how they have recognized that your body is kind of like a computer system. And they can take your fat cells, reprogram them, and with 3D printers, create a, a membrane that will dissolve and your cells will fill in the blanks to replace, I don't know, an ear, a nose, soft tissue, your aorta. And they believed that they were adding one year to the longevity of your life for every two years. And he looked out to the audience and said, those of you in your 30s, it'll be common for you to live into your 130s. And not very many of us were interested in that. So uh, then uh, uh, there's another uh, technological advancement that seems to affect our relationships. I remember when we were in fifth or sixth grade, you'd have, you'd give uh, that boyfriend or girlfriend a, a promise ring and then they break up with you and you'd go into the garage and you'd find the vice and crush it. Or maybe that was just me. But anyway, there's a new promise ring. Yeah, this promise ring here is one that you can buy. Uh, promise rings, no, uh, no spoilers or, or Netflix cheating allowed. Uh, get your hands on these series commitment rings, high tech wearables to prevent you or your significant other from watching ahead on your favorite series, the rings work with an app and streaming service to block pledged series until both rings are present in the same room. So that's fascinating. But when it comes to your industry, of course, you know, uh, with the pandemic, it kind of happened overnight. So all of a sudden the relationship between the manager and the agent and supervising agent and everybody involved in the call center was being, you know, modified, was changing. So there's two steps in change and transition we're going to be talking about. Change is kind of external, it's physical, it's mechanical, it's situational, it can happen overnight. Uh, it could be a new technology, a new project policy, procedure, roles, responsibilities, new boss, new team member. It could be more demand, less demand, more workload, PPE, maybe in uh, some of your companies, PPP, it's a lot of P's, and then and the pandemic, which changed a lot of the ways that we do our jobs. Now transition though is personal, it's more internal, it's more psychological, it's the anxiety, it's the isolation, it's the frustration, it's the, oh, I don't know, embarrassment, it's the concern, it's the worry, a lot of hand wringing goes on with the transition. So what I'm gonna share with you today are some strategies that we've become quick change artists, that when change occurs, we can modify our behavior, we can have the right attitude going into those changes, to be more action oriented because it's a lot easier to act our way into a new way of thinking than sitting around sipping coffee trying to think our way into a new way of acting. So that's what we're gonna be working on today. Some strategies to get your organization through it in one piece and 
get yourself through it in one piece and be the role model to be the leader that people would like to follow. So change is something that we've faced our whole lives. It just has been accelerated and actually happened instantly just a few months ago. So to be responsible professionals, what we need to do is see ourselves kind of like inventors, kind of like discoverers. And we need to have the courage to let go of some of the old ways we do things to kind of ab abandon our interpretations of what does and, and does not work. And we were kind of force fed, you know, some of the technology to make it happen. So we might've been scrambling for a couple of weeks or a couple of months to make sure that we were still providing the service for our clients. One of the things to keep in mind is that there's three critical connections we need to make sure that we maintain. People need to feel connected uh, to the fundamental identity of the organization. So whatever we can do to make sure they still feel like they're part of the team. Uh, people need to feel connected to the new information. So we have to figure out with the new communication channels, how we're gonna provide that information efficiently and effectively. And people need to be able to develop relationships with people anywhere in the system. So if they have a question or a concern, they know who they can contact. They know who they can reach out to. It's not as simple anymore to raise their hand and ask for some assistance or maybe ask their neighbor. You know, now they might be at home at the kitchen table or maybe they modified a bedroom in their apartment, but it's a different dynamic. It's a different environment and it's kind of an odd, awkward approach to how we used to do things. So we wanna make sure that we have access to resources, people that will help us when we get a little bit jammed up. So making the most of change, well, change uh, is different than transition. So we need to recognize those two steps. And unless the transition occurs, the changes probably aren't going to stick. They're not going to work. And to make sure that that happens, there's four stages of transition. First stage is that transition starts with an ending. Problem is we don't like endings. <laughs> it was really nice six months ago, I could come to work and I was completely confident and completely competent. And now that has changed. And now I'm worried I may not learn the new technology quick enough. I might have questions and I feel so alone. And so there's a, a lot of change of um, endings that we may not have even been aware of that were you know, uh, things that used to just happen naturally or casually when we were together in the same call center. And then we have to manage the neutral zone. And the neutral zone is kind of like nighttime between yesterday and tomorrow. Can't go back to the way things used to be. Not sure how they're going to be. And so we're kind of in that middle zone. It's kind of like going through the jungle, one vine at a time. And you have to let go of one vine to grab onto the next vine. Otherwise, you're going to feel pretty stretched and you're going to lose your momentum. Launching a new beginning on a certain day at a certain time with a new process or a new procedure or a new technology, we're going to go all in but the, it's always kind of scary because there's a chance it might not work because we've had those great ideas in the past that didn't pan out. And we kind of remember some of those ghosts of uh, failures, they sneak into our thoughts today. And throughout these three stages, of course, what you need to do is take care of yourself because if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to lead people through the change or be able to assist people that need your insight. So transition starts with an ending and we don't like ending. So don't be surprised by overreaction. It's their job, it's their career, it's their reputation that is being challenged. And it's a lot of who we are, our self-concept comes from who, you know, what we do. And so when that is changing, it's, it's hard not to take it personally. So we need to acknowledge the losses openly and sympathetically, I miss that too. Or, you know, I struggled with that for two days before I finally felt, felt comfortable. Kind of empathizing with people. So if they feel frustrated or confused or lonely or, uh, disappointed, whatever is the emotion, blend with that emotion so they feel normal, and then we can redirect them with logic. And so logic won't necessarily change an emotion, but empathy will. You blend with the emotion, they feel normal, then provide them the logic to move forward. Expect and accept the signs of grief. Uh, there's a lot of loss that we may not have even noticed, how we used to maybe chit chat in the break room or talk to a coworker in the parking lot before or after our shift or Maybe it was just uh, looking across the room and making eye contact with someone you knew well and you knew exactly what they were thinking just by making eye contact or the look on their face and, and those things are gone or the, the sense of camaraderie or to be part of a team, the, the, the hum and the buzz of being in the same office area. So uh, that's quite a loss. And so, you know, when we first hear that we're going to be working remotely and you know, we kind of deny it, wow, this probably won't last. And then it seems like it's lasting and we get kind of angry about it because now we have kids that were home in the summer and now kids that are still home, they're supposed to be at school. And, and so we have this frustration of working remotely and we used to crave the quality time with our family, but wow, we spent a lot of time with our family and 
So now we're uh, kind of uh, struggling both professionally and personally with some of those changes. And then, uh, you know, we try to bargain, you know, maybe, you know, we can come in sometime or maybe we can, you know, modify the hours and, and then we get kind of uh, exhausted from it, from the anxiety and, you know, you feel a little disoriented and it could lead to, you know, depression. So we want to make sure that we recognize that it's a loss. It's not the change as much as the loss. Part of the loss is the sense of competence and that sense of confidence. And it seems like we're always, you know, having to deal with technological changes. If you would have told me six months ago that in my business, that delivering speeches or seminars, I would need to learn seven different platforms to do that, I would have said, no way, but I had to. And so it was kind of forced upon me to learn Google Meet, I had to blow the dust off of Skype, uh, go to webinar, go to meeting. Uh, here we are on Zoom, WebEx, Microsoft Teams. Uh, yeah, uh, earlier this week, I for the first time, I delivered a presentation on StreamYard. And then um, next week, I get to learn something called Loom, which I've never heard of. So, you know, uh, the loss of that, being able to just go to the event, to set up my space, you know, to deliver my message. And now, you know, it's like getting out of a, an American-made SUV and getting into an imported sports car and taking a look at where's the signal light. Okay, I see the signal light. How do I turn the radio on okay i got that you know and well that's right it's a manual transmission and you know it takes a little while for us to get oriented so uh, that uh, that loss can be subtle but it is significant and sometimes we don't notice all those losses so we want to show that uh, one of the ways to help is to show how what we're currently doing you know focus on the continuities of what really matters we're still you know taking the calls we're still providing the information we're still serving our clients we're still you know living up to the reputation our mission statements and value statements it's just a different just a different format it's it's just a different platform and and of course it feels awkward and, and then we think we've got the hang of it it feels kind of phony because then you know something will happen and we realize well i really don't have it all down but you just got to work through that but if we can focus on the continuities that gives us a really strong foundation to absorb more changes going forward so the key is in your conversations and i love that hale mentioned you're going to have those groups I'm in, I'm in two different mastermind groups. We call them mastermind groups. That one, every other Friday, we have a little Zoom call where we talk about what we're struggling with and we help each other get better at that. But when you talk with your colleagues about to change, you gotta discuss what's over for you, uh, what's over for everyone, and then what's continuing. To, talking soothes the emotion, not talking kind of stirs trouble. So we wanna make sure we have that open dialogue. Then we have to manage the neutral zone. That's where we are kind of uh, switching horses in a way from the old technology to the new technology. Anxiety rises and motivation falls about 50%. In some organizations and in some industries, absenteeism goes up three times the normal rate because people just don't want to deal with any more change or just exhausted from it. They just don't want to face it. They'll start taking their PTO or sick days and just not come to work. Uh, but the neutral zone can also be a creative zone. This is where we can kind of open up the valves of innovation and encourage experiment and kind of foster innovation. When it comes to innovation, we can look for new solutions. We can brainstorm new ideas to solve, all, solve old problems. So kind of think of your organization now more like research and development. We're, we're learning, we're you know, not losing. To really, this might be the time to go on offense rather than defense instead of waiting to see if that technology is really going to stick. Maybe we can be on the forefront. I remember in the 80s uh, that I was one of the first people in my industry to have a fax machine. And in the 80s, that fax machine, I believe, cost me $2,200. So I don't know if that'd be 10, 15 grand today in today's dollars. But all of a sudden, I could respond to my clients instantly. And, and as far, you know, as fast as they chirp out that paper, they would roll up, you know, and then you'd have to kind of iron it out so you could read it. And sometimes it looked kind of brown over a day or two. But anyway, I, I, I was kind of on the cutting edge with a fax machine, you know, 35 years ago. So when it comes to uh, the new technology, maybe we're gonna have to iterate, reiterate, iterate, iterate, reiterate, and be more uh, willing to take a certain amount of risk, you know, so we can maybe be the trendsetter rather than waiting, waiting to see. And I'd like you to normalize and redefine the neutral zone by coming up with some sort of philosophy, some sort of a metaphor that will help your organization get through it in one piece and everyone feel like they're still part of the team. So uh, one of the ways I did this in my business is that I, this is my 30th year speaking for a living. And uh, I've been through a few of these economic bubbles or changes 
or catastrophes. I, I remember when Y2K was a big concern and turned out to be not that big of a deal. But then shortly thereafter, 9-11 happened and that was a big deal. And my industry you know, took on a shock for about a year or so before things kind of returned to normal. And then we had the recession, the real estate bubble burst in 2008, 2009, 2010, that drug on. So had to make some adjustments in how I did my business. And I remember in 2009, I had the best February I'd ever had. And I had the worst October I'd ever had in 20 years. So in the same year, I had the best month I ever had and the worst month I ever had. And I found there was a lot of ups and downs. And uh, one of the metaphors or philosophies I came up with is that the speaking business every once in a while is, is, is kind of like a roller coaster. The good news is I love roller coasters. A couple of years ago, our youngest daughter was home from college. We ran out to Valley Fair. We got the fast pass and we rode all the roller coasters three or four times in three or four hours. And we just had a ball. So if I think about the speaking business as kind of a roller coaster, ups and downs and twists and turns, exciting, exhilarating, terrifying, but I love roller coasters. If I can take that metaphor, plug it into my speaking business, then I kind of look forward to the challenge. I look forward to see what's going to happen. I can't wait to see what, what's around the next turn. Now, some of my clients will make kind of a game show approach out of it. They'll say behind door number one, behind door number two, behind door number three. Uh, sometimes they will come up with a, Oh, a song that everybody knows the, you know, the chorus or the melody and they'll change the lyrics of the song. And so everybody kind of has that mantra that they kind of recite. So they all feel like they're kind of under the same banner, headed the same direction on the same team. So we got to figure out ways that could really help people kind of temporarily get through the changes. So you want temporary systems as we go through the neutral zone, review your policies and procedures and see if there's enough flexibility to give people enough room you know, to learn. Uh, the new technology is always a little bit of a learning curve and a little productivity drop at first. And I like to always set short-term goals, that, you know, what we're gonna do today, what we're gonna do by the end of the week. And that way they're bite-sized and we always have the opportunity for people to be successful heading the direction we would like and then we can celebrate those successes regularly. So we wanna make sure that we, you know, Take a look at any special training that people may need, whether it's the technology or thinking more creatively or just absorbing the shock of change like we're talking about today and managing stress or working together differently as a team. But we wanna make sure that we provide those resources. And since we're talking about teams, you know, I think years ago I worked with you about uh, putting together a, a team in the call center. And we talked about these four phases of team development, orientation and then uh, sometimes call that forming, you know, getting a group together, what are we doing, you know, uh, what's, what's going on, and then storming, a little bit of conflict, lively debate, different perspectives are shared, different opinions are aired, and so we have that lively conversation, and then norming is we informally, we don't use parliamentary procedures and ask for a discussion three times and wrap the gavel or, you know, take a vote, but, uh, you know, a normal, uh, kind of a informal rule in how we resolve those conflicts, and then uh, performing, that's where we say, who's gonna do what when? So orientation phase, you discuss the project, the picture of the plan, the part people are going to play, roles, responsibilities, communication norms, how we're gonna share information and how team members can be successful if we have someone new joining the team. So you make proper introductions of new people and build rapport and, and, and that builds trust because you know each other. We have to know people before we trust people. So uh, four phases of team development, orientation, forming, conflict, the lively discussion, and then interactions, behaviors, merging ideas, how we compromise to reach agreement, and then who's gonna do what, when, where, and how. So those phases are pretty clear. It's kind of like riding a roller, not a roller coaster, but an elevator, you know, like first floor, orientation, second floor, mm, gonna have a little lively discussion, next floor, oh, we gotta figure out how to resolve the conflict. Then you might go down a couple of floors. What are we trying to do again? But you know what the next floor is going to be, you know what the next step is going to be, you know where you're headed, or you need to backtrack, you know where you're at. So it's kind of nice to know what the next step is, but it's a little bit different now. So the new normal, we have new phases in a way, and we kind of call this renorming and informing and transforming and outperforming and celebrating the new more, more norming. So it's, it's a little bit different combination of activities. So renorming is we acknowledge you know, work is different. And so we all agree, you know, it's not the same. Then we establish agreements as far as responsibilities and quantification and communication. And we share any concerns we have as far as flexibility, whether it's hours or results or accomplishments. 
And then informing, we talk about the communication, the modes, the quantity, quality, formality, informality, email, you know, we're gonna have video conferencing, we're gonna see each other, we're gonna Zoom call, or we're gonna use Slack or some sort of a kind of a communication board that people can, you know, share information freely with each other. And then transforming, building a kind of a new culture now, you know, more remote workers, but we wanna make sure they feel included. So how are we going to come up with some methods for strengthening relationships and encouraging discussion and disagreement and dialogue? So we get all those creative ideas, we get all those insights, kind of creating a third reservoir of knowledge that didn't exist before. And how we're gonna follow through on accountability. And then outperforming is with these newfound and developed skills, you know, we maybe can enhance our customer service. We can maybe be more creative in solving problems in the future. And sometimes when I give seminars on problem solving and decision making, we have to stop and think, you know, when something significantly changes in our industry, is this really a problem or is this just a situation or is this an opportunity? And if we can take a look at the menu of different ways we can approach the issue, we might think it's a problem, it's a really terrible thing, and then I have people go through the seven steps of solving that problem thinking it's terrible. Or we can go to the other end of the extreme and say this is an opportunity. We're so lucky that we have this challenge. And then they think about how wonderful and exciting it is, this new opportunity, and they go through those seven steps to solve the problem. And then we come back and say, you know, it's just a situation. Everybody in our industry is dealing with this and then go through those seven steps of solving the problem that this is just the general course of business. But then when you get done, you have literally three different answers on how you would solve that problem. So then which one of those would you like to invest the emotional energy and time to, to put into place, to implement? And it's kind of, kind of, it's really fun to see how different those solutions can be if we just change kind of the context of how we're approaching that. So modifying our processes and trying to deliver increased performance and better results. And then of course, celebrating. We never wanna forget that. And uh, since we have gone through the gauntlet of the changes in the neutral zone, it's elevated trust, it's enhanced our enthusiasm, it's reaffirmed our confidence, we have that back. And then we're kind of asking, what can we try next? Because we have this newfound approach to technology. So one of the things that will help is to make sure you have these conversations with your coworkers and colleagues. What's causing anxiety and the rest of the staff concern? What are some weaknesses that have been uncovered and what's some training that we need to acquire? So we can also maybe come up with a metaphor, philosophy of how we can get through the neutral zone and think of ways that we can temporarily do something differently that will help. And then launching a new beginning, we're all in, but it's always kind of a gamble because it might not work. So the key is to sell the four Ps so people really know what we're up to. So the purpose, and the purpose is the good reason why. The status quo isn't cutting it. Uh, you know, the numbers aren't uh, being met. Uh, the, you know, lockdown or stay at home mandates or, you know, they're still making it up whether it's Washington DC or St. Paul. So you talk about the purpose and then the plan. This will take a week, this will take a month, this will take uh, three months. So it seems pretty well thought out. Uh, the picture, what will this look like? Can we go somewhere and see it in action? Is there some way we can do a role play? Can you, you know, let us kind of see it so we can believe it? And then the last is the part that people will play and how valuable, critical that role is and where do they fit in that process? So reinforce those new beginnings by ensuring quick successes with those short-term goals and then celebrate the successes, any small success that's headed in the right, right direction. So whenever we launch a new beginning, we have to talk about what's the purpose, what's the picture, what's the plan, what's the part you will play and what part others will play and have that discussion to get it completely aired out so everybody knows what we're going to do. And then of course you have to take care of yourself. So you have to figure out what's actually changing for you and what's really over for you. It could be an understanding of your value to the organization. It could be a belief uh, you had about how a call center or, should, or contact center should be managed or it could be uh, the image you have of your own organization and how that's been altered. And we have to really distinguish between current losses and, and old wounds so we don't drag in, oh, you know, ghost stories from the past when things didn't work out. And we can identify the continuities in ourselves. you know, what are our personal interests, relationships, or recreational activities that aren't changing. They might be, you know, involved in them differently, you know, wearing a mask instead of, you know, you didn't have to wear a mask or might be, you know, creating a certain amount of distance where it used to be more, hey, you know, a, a handshaking or hugging or those sort of things. But, you know, there's a certain amount of our life that hasn't changed either. And sometimes we can do an accounting of that and have that as a foundation to move forward. 
So I'd like you to kind of put together a learning adventure, just to experiment a little bit every day and make a plan to change your life a little bit. And think about the purpose and the plan and the picture, what this will look like. And, you know, the part you will play and other people will play. Have that conversation with your family members and your colleagues. So making the most of change, I think this is the way to do it. Just keep showing up, be present, be engaged, be involved in the conversation, share your perspective, frustrations, vulnerabilities. Only if we know those can we help people. And then tell the truth, whatever you know for sure, and then let go and say, I'll see you tomorrow. And then you show up and be present, be empathetic, sympathetic, engaged in the conversations, tell the truth, whatever you know for sure, and say, see you tomorrow, and help people get through the changes in your organization too. So what are you gonna to do to take care of yourself? What interest, hobby, recreational activity, or old relationship are you going to invest some time? I always like to have people think about what are the relationships in your life that are supporting you, and who are the people in your relationships that are distorting you, and it might be time for us to take a month off from those relationships that are not supportive. Think about what classes, courses, knowledge, or skill you could acquire that would really be fun in your learning adventure. So that's your homework. So it seems pretty simple. Yep, there's change and there's transition. We go through those four phases or stages of transition. What could go wrong? Well, there's a couple of things. One of the things is failing to manage the stress. And a couple of months ago, we talked about managing the stress, provided 15 physical remedies, 15 psychological strategies. If you didn't get a chance to jot those all down, <laughs> you can go to my website, seminarsonstress.com, and you can download the 30 tips. Uh, absolutely free. I don't ask for your email. I'm not going to put you on a list you'll never get off of the rest of your life. Just go to seminarsonstress.com. On the landing page, there's a big old red bar there that says 30 tips and managing stress. Click that. You get a free download. Uh, so uh, managing the stress, you know, so we don't become burned out because if you become burned out, it may take two to four years to recover from burnout. And no one ever said to me, those are the best years of their life. They're the longest days of your life. And I'm sure when you were in the middle of April and you found out it was Wednesday, you're thinking, my goodness, this today has been the longest month in my life. You know, uh, it just seemed like there was, you know, never ending changes. One of the other mistakes we make is joining the anti-change crowd. And let's take a look at this conversation and see if there's something we can learn from this. I'm going to turn this volume down for those of you that have earbuds on, just to make sure it isn't too loud. Hi, this is Kent Welchlin, and welcome to Welchlin.com. Today's video blog is on change. The question is, do I join the anti-change crowd? Oh, oh, okay, great. Just got a message from IT. They're upgrading everyone's cell phone across the organization again. But I'm just getting used to this one. Ah, so many changes going on around here. I miss the good old days. Why can't things just stay the same? I'm thinking about forming or joining an anti-change crowd. Well, I would not recommend joining the anti-change crowd. Uh, some people will decide not to change and they may not be able to keep their career. I learned a long time ago growing up on the farm that it's a lot easier to ride the horse in the direction it's headed. I don't know if you've ever been on a horse that wants to go back to the barn. It's going back to the barn. It's an 800 pound animal. All you have is a bit and bridle and the more you slap it on the ears, cuss and swear, the more likely it's going to scrape you off on a tree or the barn door on the way in. It's the same way when it comes to organizational change, when the industry is changing, when your organization is changing, sometimes you have to go along with it because it is a lot easier to ride the horse in the direction it's headed. Whoa, Nelly, I mean, Kit. Maybe some change will do me some good. I'm just going to need to saddle up and ride the tide of change. Yeehaw, giddy up organization. Wow, how'd you like to work with that guy every day? Uh, not too long ago, I was speaking at a CEO conference and that video was in the presentation and a woman came up to me and said, you know, that other guy in the videos with you, he's, he's kind of distracting. I said, you know, that's me, don't you? No, it's not. Yes, it is. And I have to work with him every day. But there's a, I don't see a future in joining the anti-change crowd. You want to be the person that has a reputation to support the change and help move it along. Some people act like a victim. They throw a pity party and they invite other people to attend and they talk about how helpless they feel and how hopeless it is. Doesn't make us very attractive as a coworker. Uh, playing the new game the old way, wow, that's exhausting. That's double time. It'd be just about as silly as if uh, you mentioned to me that you're headed to Chicago this weekend and I run out to my SUV and I come back and I give you a map and it's a map of Minneapolis and St. Paul. 
And you say, well, Kip, this is a map of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Yes, I know. I've used it for about 20 years. I'm going to Chicago. Yes, major metropolitan area. I think this map will help. But this is a map of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Yeah, freeway system, water, seen it on Atlas. Same thing in Chicago. And you hand the map back to me and you say, Kip, I don't think this will work for me. And I'm a little bit offended by that. And I say, you know, here's a tool I've been using for 20 years. And you flatly deny it has any value. But that's how silly it is trying to play the new game the old way. We have to let go of the old map, grab onto the new map, and figure out where we're headed. And sometimes it's very difficult for us to let go of that old map. And we try to do, you know, two ways. And it's 120 minute hours and it's exhausting. Requesting a low stress work environment, take the pressure off. I don't know, you know, if they take the pressure off, that means we're going to be mortgaging the future. And if you think it's tough now, it's going to be tougher later. We should really, you know, make sure we keep moving it along. Trying to control the uncontrollable. Cubby always talked about this. And we talked about this with uh, handling uh, stress too. But Cubby used to say there's, you know, four main concerns that people have. It's called the circle of concern. And inside there's the little circle of influence, something we can actually do something about. But the first one is uh, uh, employment. Let's say I was running the uh, contact center and I came out one day and said, there's going to be some changes around here. People gasp, uh-oh, uh uh-oh, somebody's going to lose their job. And then if you think somebody's going to lose their job, they might lose their house and even a natural disaster like that hurricane down south or flood or fires out west, breaks our heart to see people's lives swept away. So if I lose my job, I might lose my house. What will people think? And so reputation is on the line. And we've all known people with a great reputation. One dumb decision, one dumb act, and it all disappears. And you know, right away we ask, what were they thinking? Because once you tarnish that reputation, it'll never be the same because people always remember that one time. And then if we worry about those three things, of course, it'll affect our health. And if we lose our health, we lose everything. So the circle of influence is that you just keep showing up. You just be engaged, be present, tell the truth and let go. And that's how you get through the gauntlet of change. Uh, pacing yourself, sometimes we do that, but if the industry is running, we can't be jogging, we're gonna have to get in stride. Continuing to do the old and the new, oh, that's exhausting. And we have to let go of the old, Ca you know, being cautious, freeze, and we freeze like a deer in the headlights and that <laughs> reality hits, you gotta keep moving. And being afraid of the unknown, I don't even know why I have that on the slide. You're creating the future. How in the world could you possibly be afraid of it? I think I'm gonna take that off the next time I present this program. Making a big deal out of little things. Oh yeah, I had a mentor back in the 80s that used to call that pole vaulting over mouse turds. He said, you better make sure you don't stake your career on petty issues. You wanna make sure you stake your career on the biggest issues, the most important tasks, the most important objective. Psychologically disengaging from your work. You hear yourself and your self-talk saying, I have to, or I must, or I should. Not very motivating. I get to, I want to, I look forward to. Woo, changes our attitude, changes our actions. Avoiding new challenges, I have always found that change is a full contact sport. You gotta get in the game to develop the skills to protect your career and your contact center. Trying to get all the answers in all the directions. Hey, you know what, they're still making it up. Whether it's the technology or St. Paul or whether it's your community or your county or Washington DC. So we're just gonna have to be flexible. I always tell my clients I'm flexible. I'm no longer limber, but I am flexible. So we wanna make sure that we're that nimble and that agile to make sure we can make those adjustments. And assuming caring administration or management should keep you comfortable, I don't know, that might be the most cold-blooded thing they've ever done because that means they're not pushing us to develop the skills to protect our career and those that we, that we lead. So I wanna share with you some new work behaviors that I think help guarantee results. One of those is to set goals and take action and to become a quick change artist. You wanna make sure you have a long list of past accomplishments to restore your confidence and then uh, give yourself a compliment when nobody else is. So have some positive affirmations where you say, I'm decisive, I make good decisions, I'm committed to the industry. Now, when it comes to SMART goals, there's a variety of different ways that people, you know, uh, Put the words to that acronym. I wanted to be specific, of course, specific actions, numbers, ratios, percentages, those sort of things, you know, how we're going to measure that. And then I like it to be the A to be action oriented. The, don't leave the scene of the decision without taking action. You have an idea, you make the phone call, you have an idea, you send the email, you have an idea, you schedule the meeting, but we need to be more action oriented. And then the R, of course, realistic. And the way we build the realistic part of it in is you know, timing, well, when are we gonna start? When are we going to stop? 
And timeliness is based upon Parkinson's law of time management. Usually how much time we allow is how much time we'll take. Isn't it amazing when we have to have something sent by noon today, 11.57, we're hitting send. If we have to have something uh, ready for UPS or Federal Express at four o'clock, it's 3.57, we're putting it on the counter. Isn't it amazing how much time we're allowed is kind of how much time we take. So the, my question is always, why take so much time? I was recently working with a coal-fired power plant that was going to be shut down. And then right next door, they were building a billion dollar gas-fired power plant for cleaner emissions. And the safety committee had me come in quarterly to talk to all of the employees for two years to prepare them for the change because they're gonna go from 186 employees at the coal fire plant to 37 employees at the new plant. 150 people or so were either gonna to have to retire earlier than they planned, go to school to learn a new trade, or go to a different power plant and you know take on a different job with new people and form new relationships. And some people are gonna be the first family member that lost their job at the plant. So they had a lot of professional and personal concerns. And so what we did is we talked about grief. You know, you're gonna, you know, this new power plant, you're gonna deny that they're gonna shut down the coal plant and the gas plant. You probably think they're gonna run both of them. Well, they're not, but go ahead and deny it today. Then tomorrow, why don't you do this? Uh, get angry about it, you know? And then on Wednesday, how about we just go ahead and uh, try to bargain, see if there's a way you can increase the output of the old plant. Maybe, you know, they could decrease the plant, you know, but uh, you try that. Uh, Thursday, go ahead and get anxious. Uh, Friday, go ahead and be disoriented. Through the weekend, be a little bit, bit depressed, but I'll tell you what, we should be, you know, through it on Monday. If you're in something, get in it. If you're not, get out. If we know the stages, get in them, get out of them. So how much time we allow is how much time we'll take. Otherwise, you know what? I said, you could drag this out for the rest of your life. And I'm sure you have people that are friends or family members that had a big change in their career, you know, and they still talk about it. Years later, decades later, just keep dragging it around like pig pen on the Peanuts comics. So timeliness, when are we going to start? When are we going to stop? And usually the work will conform to that time limit. I think that's critical. And I'd like you to develop the right image. But the best book I ever read was a book entitled Reaching Out by Dr. David W. Johnson. And he dedicated a chapter to this list called the six criteria of personal credibility. Six things we need to put in place as a leader, as a manager, as a supervisor, to start our work relationships out most effectively. No particular order, according to his research, if you're lacking any one of these qualities, you're lacking credibility. Five out of six doesn't cut it. Four out of six, worse, First one, consistently appear warm and friendly. It's not that you're high five and a back slap and saying how great it is to work together every day, but you're consistently pleasant, easy to and accessible to communicate with. Express intentions and motives, short-term plans, long-term goals so people know what you're up to. Follow through with what you said you're going to be. Demo do, uh, demonstrate trustworthiness. Uh, be an information source, what's pinned, pasted, posted on the wall, the guidebooks, handbooks, website, to the point, you develop relevant expertise in certain areas of what you do, you know more about that than anybody else. And when people have a question about that, they seek you out for the answers rather than wasting their time talking to anyone else. And the last is you demonstrate dynamism, natural enthusiasm. It actually appears that it, you enjoy your job. And when you walk in a room, the lights get a little bit brighter rather than a little bit dimmer. When you come to work, people are happy to see you rather than resenting the fact you showed up again today. And they're all free. It's all, they're all free. And I'd like you to manage time management, become the master of time management and to minimize self-generated time wasters and to minimize environmental time bandits. And the way I'd like you to approach this is think about your daily activities and what 5% of what you're currently doing could you do less of, which would free up 5% of your time to do more of something that really is a better use of your time. And then what 5% of your activities can you stop doing waste of time that would free up 5% of your time to start doing something you haven't done, but would have a tremendous impact on your future success. So I'd like you to kind of dial that in like a combination lock, 5% less, 5% more, 5% stop, 5% start. Now I know that's a, only really a four hour difference in time management and a four hour work week, but wouldn't it be great to have four hours a week to focus on what you believe to be the best use of your time? So it's gonna have a tremendous difference. Now, some of those self-generated time wasters, disorganization. 
What did our parents used to say? A place for everything and everything in its place. Awfully good advice. I have a time management book over here that claims we spend 45 minutes a day, personally and professionally combined, just looking for things. Six work weeks, just looking for things. So if we get organized, I have it right here. I have it right here. I don't know if that's gonna take two hours or two days or two weeks, but get organized. One of the other time bandits is procrastination. And let's see if we can learn something from this conversation about that. I'm gonna turn this down, just, now. Nah, that looks good. Here we go. Hi, this is Kip Welchlin, and welcome to Welchlin.com. Today's video blog is on procrastination. The question is, why do I procrastinate? Great person. I usually have the courage to act, but sometimes I get stuck and I kind of freeze. I don't get chilly, I just sit. I wore my favorite t-shirt today, top 10 reasons I procrastinate, but I didn't even start that. Why do I procrastinate? Well, usually it is fear that stops us from taking action. There are many fears that can immobilize you and cause you to procrastinate. I will share with you 16 reasons why people procrastinate. Fear of imperfection. Some things need to be done perfectly. Everything else doesn't. Fear of not being ready. Concern that you may not have all the information you need to move forward. Sometimes it's the fear of the unknown. You find yourself asking, what will people think? Fear of being overwhelmed task is so complex you don't know where or how to start. Fear of making mistakes? Mistakes are part of life. Ask, what can I learn from this? Fear of pain and dread. When you postpone an unpleasant task, attempting to make life easier and avoiding the distasteful. Fear of success? Concern that you must continue to succeed more and more. Could be fear of bad timing, battling your natural biological rhythms and energy cycles. It could be the fear of having to live up to a high standard hoping others won't expect such high quality work from you in the future. Fear of no pressure. Some people believe that they need pressure to focus and to finish. It could be the fear of change, worrying that the change will render you incompetent or irrelevant. It could be the fear of difficulty. The task seems so difficult that you won't even start. It could be the fear of too much responsibility. Once a person starts something, the concern becomes, will they be able to consistently continue the work? And it could be the fear of finishing. Concern that if you finish this task, there will be another awful job to do. And it could be the fear of being rejected. It's hard not to take it personally when there is proof that you are flawed in some ways. It could be the fear of making the wrong decision, so we get busy with trivial activities to avoid making a decision. I, I do like the trivial activities. There's no risk. I, I think my fears are probably the fears of success and having to live up to a high standard. I wish my parents would have raised me up as a lazy slacker. Oh my goodness. You know, when it comes to procrastination, I know there's three that affect me. One is a catastrophic failure, thinking about what's the worst thing that could possibly happen. And then I realize not doing something, that's the worst thing that could happen. The other is overgeneralization. Sometimes they call it the pain pleasure principle. Maybe there's a task that you have to do for the very first time, or maybe there's some new paperwork that you have to fill out. And the first time you attempt it, you make six mistakes and you think, oh, I'm so stupid. No, you're not stupid. You wouldn't be in the position you're in if you're stupid. Then the next month you fill out that form, you make three mistakes and you think, oh, I'm not gonna get it. Actually, it's getting better. And you might not notice that over the last four months, you know, you've been filling it out accurately. But because that initial experience with it was so painful, we pushed that off to do something more pleasurable. That's when I'm a little surprised that I do this for a living, giving speeches and seminars. Well, about 40 years ago, I was in a play in high school called The King and I, and there's lines, and I was the king, and there were lines in the play where the king shouts at the school teacher, if I shall sit, you shall sit. Well, guess what I said opening night? 140 people in the little theater in St. James High School going, eh, it's kind of liberating. I stayed in character. Pam Hansen had tears coming down her cheeks trying to stay in character. I stormed off the stage and the Play was sold out the next three nights. But whenever I get around words like that, I always slow them down. Uh, the other is perfectionism. I gotta tell you, I did deliver a perfect presentation one time, and it was back in 1993. It was down the road over here uh, at the Maplewood Inn. It was for District 622, Oakdale, North St. Paul, Maplewood School District. Three hour presentation on interpersonal communication skills. I wanted to take a break every hour on the hour, and I'd say, it's time for us to take a break. I'd look at my watch, and second hand was just sweeping by. I mean, exactly an hour. Then everything I said that was supposed to be funny, I was hilarious. Everything I said that was, they were supposed to take seriously, they wrote it down. I never got tongue-tied for three hours. 
everything I wanted to, you know, three, 30 people, 30 evaluations, 30 tents. It was perfect. And I remember walking out under that awning at the day's end. I took a look to see if there was a cloud in the sky, thinking for sure it was going to get hit by lightning. I don't know if I had watched Caddyshack too many times or what. I looked a half a dozen times before I crossed the street, thinking for sure I was going to get run down in the road. I drove exactly 55 miles an hour on my way home on Highway 36. My hands were trembling. It was so uncomfortable to give that perfect presentation. I made sure it hasn't happened again since. Set your standards low, then you can always overachieve. That's what I say. But those are the things that kind of stall me. So procrastination, you know, it's a daily battle. Inability to say no, the key is to say no, give the reason. No, give the same reason. No, give the same reason. Got to push past that Minnesota or Midwest nice. We know this, even the best salespeople don't close four times. So people will finally believe you if you say the same reason three times. Lack of interest, you gotta build that in. Now for me, I've been able to stay in business for 30 years and this is my model. I deliver a presentation, I make two phone calls. That's it. I show up and I call people back. When then I get my treat. Now my treat is a Russell Stover French mint. There's only 60 calories in that little chocolate cube of heaven. I leave them in the refrigerator because I think they stay I think they taste better cooler. Now next month, I go to the fun size Snickers. You can buy them all year round, not just during Halloween. I put those in the freezer, uh, but don't bite them right away because they're like little bricks and they'll break your dental work. So uh, I just think they taste better frozen. And then uh, the next month, because I'm kind of a cheap man, I go to the Andes mints. They kind of taste like wax, but they're only a buck 44 a box at Cub. And uh, so uh, that still motivates me. So my uh, daily reward is a, a little snack, a little treat. And so you got to figure out how you reward yourself daily. So you build in that interest. Burnout, we talked about stress last time. You know, we don't want to become burned out, have physical remedies, psychological strategies. Don't get engaged in gossip because if people are talking to you today about somebody else, they'll be talking to somebody else about you tomorrow. So we want to nip that in the bud. And then unnecessary perfectionism. Yep, some things need to be done perfectly. Everything else doesn't. If I'm laying in the hospital bed and the doctor and nurse are saying, is that 50 milligrams or five milligrams? I'm gonna say, hey, would you double check that? But if, I, if my chicken dinner comes and I was hoping it'd be hot and it was just warm, eh, you know, I'm okay with that, you know? So perfectionism, yeah, some things not, need to be done perfectly, but you know, most things don't. Environmental time bandits that rob us of our productivity, visitors stopping by, stand up, tends to cut the conversation in half, don't have any place for them to sit ask questions, you know, before I leave, would there be anything else? You know, I, that's right, I have something I need to do for you and get out of the conversation. Telephone calls, you know, take those standing up every once in a while. We seem just to be a little bit more direct. How can I help you? What exactly is it that you need? Uh, before we hang up, is there anything else? You know, I do have a meeting in about three minutes, what's going on? And so you can kind of have them live within that parameter. Uh, mail and email, you have four Ds. Do it right away. If it's two minutes or less, delete it. See if they meant it. <laughs> uh, delegate it to somebody else. See if you can get somebody else to do it uh, or defer it. And so let the person know I will work on that Friday afternoon between 1 and 3 p.m. So they know you got it and you're going to take care of it. Uh, waiting for someone, bring something along so it's constructive time, not a waste of time. Unproductive meetings, 11 million meetings are held in the United States every single day. Not all of them at your organization. Other organizations have meetings too. Want to make sure they're well done. Have a good agenda. Everybody knows what their role is. Crises, other people's problems. You got to get in the habit of saying, good luck with your problem. We can't absorb everybody's crises and problems. The compassion fatigue will put you under. Coffee conversations. If you see someone coming towards you with a coffee cup, run. Run for your life because they'll stand there till it's bone dry and stone cold. And then unused or unnecessary reports. Just because technology can pump it out doesn't mean we necessarily need to read all of it. So you might want to highlight or make sure you uh, demonstrate what you know paragraphs, what numbers are most important so people can be efficient in understanding that information. So when it really comes down to mastering time management, you have to ask yourself, what controls your time? Well, tasks and activities in which you have total control and tasks or activities in which you have some control. Tasks or activities in which we have total control, I don't know, uh, I suppose it'd be our attitude. You know, we can manage our own morale. It probably also would be what we eat. I've never accidentally eaten anything and I'm sure you haven't either. Uh, what we say, I don't know if you're like me, but I spend most of my time biting my tongue. It's crazy in here. You know, what little bit of that I share with other people. I suppose what we wear, you know, to make sure we're dressed, you know, to play the part or that we're expected to professionally. What we do, we have quite a bit of control.
But after that, it tends to be just tasks or activities in which we have some control, which is everything else in our life. We just need to take a little bit of that control back. So there's three tests of time I'd like you to consider when you're going through tremendous change. One is test of necessity. Do we really need to do that anymore or not? Would our customers notice? Would our competition notice? So test of necessity. Do we really still need to do it or not? Now, if you need to do it, then it's the test of appropriateness. Who can do it? Who has the talent, ability, and skill to perform this task? Do we have someone within our organization that can do that? Or do we need to outsource someone that can do that? Because we already agreed it has to be, in, it's necessary to be done. So now we have to figure out who could do it. And then the test of efficiency. How could we use technology? How could we improve the process or procedure just to be more efficient? I love those three tests of time because we can really clarify what we need to do to take action. One of the other things I'd like you to do is establish responsibilities. Who's responsible for what? And establish priorities so everyone's focused on the most valuable task. Establish objectives, kind of the quantity of activities that need to get done. And we have some sort of a master list. So when somebody has the time, they can keep chipping things off that list and then eliminating unnecessary activities, eliminate any inappropriate activities. And then, you know, personally and professionally, as much as you can, plan annually, then monthly, then weekly, then daily. In our personal life, you know who's getting married, you know uh, their birthdays, you know special events and dates that are important to the people you love and care about. Got to block in those dates early, otherwise you'll sell out on your values every day. I'd like you to write your own personal mission statement. I'd like you to think about what you really do for people and what you really do for your organization. And then it's much easier for us to accept ambiguity and uncertainty. But if we really think about what do I do for people and what do I do for organizations, it really gives us the opportunity to think about what's the best use of my time. And usually it comes down to doing one thing that's the most urgent. If we don't get that done, we're gonna get yelled at or there'll be a penalty, there'll be a fine, there'll be a complaint. And the second is what's most important, values clarification, empowerment, training, relationship building, planning, prevention, those sort of things. Prioritize two tasks at a time. When you get those done, you can pat yourself on the back, say, good job, Welchie. Now what's most urgent, most important? And then if somebody has uh, something that they bring to your attention that is urgent and important, you can say to them, you know, I have these two tasks that I'm finishing. I would be available to focus on that at 1.30. And so you have some flexibility. The thing that really is a benefit to prioritizing only two tasks at a time is that you feel like a winner all day. If you have a, you know, if you put down everything that you feel like you need to get done today, you might have 75 things to do today. And if you only get six of those done, you feel like kind of a loser. But if you only prioritize two tasks at a time, you get those two done, say, good job, Welchie, next to, good job, Welchie, next to, you feel like a winner all day because you did what was most valuable. And if you balance it, one urgent, one important, the things that would have been a crisis later aren't because you already invested the time and effort, you know, when you did it in advance and you're planning. So I just love two at a time. You feel great all day long. Uh, behave like you're a consultant and make suggestions. Act like you're in business for yourself. If you could call all the shots, if you were the boss and that ultimate control, what would you do differently with meetings and information sharing and activities and events and technology and uh, underutilized equipment, underutilized assets and volunteers. But if you could, you know, have control of all of those variables, what, what would you do? Well, then what would you suggest? And how are you gonna pursue those ideas? I came across a study one time that claimed that 97% of the population can think at a genius level at different times of their lives. You have truly genius thoughts. The key is to capture those and share those. It might not be the idea we need right now, but it might be exactly what we need a week from now or a month from now. So you got to make sure you get those ideas out. I'd like you to continue your education. We know the more you learn, the more you earn. Couldn't care less about that. I'm just amazed the difference a good book makes in our decision making. But be creative about it. Think about what you could watch on YouTube or there's some online resources or newsletters or form a mastermind group or a personal board of directors that can give you feedback or Think, look at the arts or different types of literature, or find some role models that have been able to kind of balance their personal and professional lives and continue their education. Ask them how they did it, you know, take them out for a nice lunch or a few cups of coffee to figure out how you can explain this or communicate this to your, to your family members. I think broadly consider the big picture, hold yourself personally accountable for outcomes. I'd like you to get some mentors, I'd like you to do it three ways. 
Uh, one way is just based upon age, somebody that's significantly older than you and somebody that's significantly younger than you. The older person can provide sage advice and wisdom, what's a big deal, not a big deal. Young person has command of the latest technology and can kind of mentor up. Then someone inside your organization you know and trust, someone outside your organization you know and trust to get feedback from them. And then someone that's a winner and somebody that's a loser. That person that's a winner, whatever they're reading, get a copy of it. Whatever they're doing, ask if you can be part of it. Whatever you're thinking, consider that. Now, this person that's struggling, whatever they're reading, take that away and give them something else to read. Whatever they're doing, stop them. Whatever they're thinking, have them reconsider. But become the mentor for someone else and to be able to really be a role model for them. Also, I'd like you to be visible. Uh, to always be in the line of sight. Whenever there's a meeting, attend it. When there's a discussion, be part of it. But you want to make sure, especially when you're working remotely, that you're not lost, that you want to make sure that people see you and find you, you know, they see things happening, they see you. They see things, you know, they see things happening. Then when they see you, they expect things to happen. What a great reputation that would be. And number eight, of course, is how do you uniquely add value? Make sure you contribute more than you cost. If you're going to get paid for performance, would you get a bonus or a bill? What are your personal attributes? Why are people so thankful that you chose to be in their contact center? What, what is it about how you establish, maintain trust or maintain those relationships or create a cohesive team spirit? But what is it about you and your personality that people are so relieved, whether it's your customers or your staff, that you're part of the team? And we really need to recognize that and maybe turn that up just a notch to help people get through these challenging times. I'd like you to really stop and think about your customers, uh, the, your internal customers, your coworkers, external customers, the people that you serve. And I'd like you to see yourself as a service center. So what do your customers do and how do you fit in the picture and uh, what, what is it that your customers need? Uh, what, what pleases them, that they're delighted that they've interacted with you and how do you contribute to their success? Now, when I was in manufacturing in the 80s, I had an old tape series called Lead the Field by Earl Nightingale. And on my way to work, there was one segment of the tape I would listen to, and this is what it would say. If you would spend just 15 minutes a day thinking about how you could serve your customers, I don't know if the tape was stretched or what, or if that was really his voice, but if you would spend no less than 15 minutes a day thinking about how you could serve your customers better, you would lead the field. So that's what we would do. We'd think about how could we serve GE better, Midland Ross Corporation better, Sure to Michael better, uh, Telex better. So we, we'd think about today, what could we do to be just a little bit better and contribute to their success? And it was a thriving business. Number 10, put uh, yourself in the right frame of mind. I'd like you to manage your own morale. You may be going through grief, you know, denial, anger, bargaining, anxiety, and sadness, disorientation, you know, but move on. So what could you do that it can help put you in your right frame of mind? It could be music, it could be singing, but you gotta figure out a way to take care of that yourself. And then I also like you to become a good failure, not failure, but failure. Ask questions, make suggestions, fail. Ask questions, make suggestions, fail. Because that's that creation of those new ideas might be exactly what we need to solve future problems. And believe in the law of uh, self-expectancy and the self-fulfilling prophecy. We think a certain way, we act a certain way, people respond to us just the way we thought they would. So if you think the next couple of months are gonna be challenging, well, they will be for you. If you think they're gonna be exciting, you're right, they will be for you. And I think if we start out with an attitude of gratitude, that we're so lucky to be working with the organization we are, to be part of this association that is helpful and supportive. I mean, we have so many resources available to us now that we didn't have when we first took the job. Remember how excited you were when you took the job on the first day? Called your family, called your friends, said you got the job. You didn't know who you were going to be working with, didn't know what new relationships you were going to build or new technologies you were going to learn. Now today, when we have those kind of changes, you know, we're reluctant and we're kind of anxious. Really? You were excited about this job before you even took it. Can you imagine how many more resources and skills you have? How much more you have to work with? We should be just as excited about our job today as when we took it the first day. And uh, make sure you don't give up. And the way we don't give up is make sure you write objectives. Just make sure you know what you're up to. Keep a master list so you can check those off. Prioritize so the resources are being used in the most effective way. Manage distractions so you don't burn a lot of daylight on petty activities. And then just make sure you take action. Just keep moving forward. 
And you know, one of the things that gets in the way is procrastination. So make a commitment that you're action oriented, you're decisive, you move things along and then get honest with yourself if you delay, if you, you know, don't take action. I, I don't usually, uh, you know, uh, cite Picasso very often, but he said, only put off until tomorrow what you're willing to die having left undone. When I came across that quote, I contacted my attorney and updated my will, you know? So you gotta get honest with yourself. If we don't develop these new talents and skills, learn the new technology, what kind of an impact is that going to have on my contact center and all my coworkers? Set empowering goals in which you reward yourself daily. The Russell Stover Mints work for me, <laughs> the little bite-sized Snickers and the, and the, uh, and those awful mints, those Andes mints, but you know, that's what I need. Apply flexible time management where you have a little bit of a break to just get some fresh air, to clear your mind, go for a short walk, but might not get a coffee break, but might get a chance to spend a little time just listening to nature. And then practice the five minute rule. As soon as you catch yourself procrastinating on a project, drag it back, focus on it for five minutes, hard schedule when you're going to finish it. And so you catch yourself procrastinating and you take action to make sure you finish that activity. So that's what I'm suggesting, I guess, is to just take a minute at the beginning of your day and uh, change your attitude because in that minute, it'll change your entire day, might even change your entire life. And if I was an actor, I get paid to play a role. Guess what? At work, we get paid to play a role. You know all the characters, giving you some of your lines, some of your stage directions. Now all you need to do is play your part and be the role model. Now, if you ever want any additional information, you can contact me directly, kid at welchland.com or kid at seminarsonstress.com. I have a couple of YouTube channels you're welcome to visit with lots of videos with me and the goofy guy. So uh, YouTube, uh, Kit Welchland, a lot of those are communication issues from customer service to handling difficult people to working together as a team and effective communication techniques. Or you can go to YouTube seminars on stress and there are, there are about 50 videos there of stress management techniques that will help you manage the stress. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna end the show here. And there must be some questions I would imagine. Isn't there? Excellent, excellent job, Kit. Thank oh. you so much. Yeah, I'd also like to just emphasize that we've had Kit speak uh, for half, half day and full day events in the past. And when Kit gets in front of, uh, the group and have them interact in exercises. It just, you know, is off the charts how much more you get from these conversations and you take home with you. And I know that you got some good workbooks and, and materials that people can help not only fulfill their professional jobs, but their, their personal lives as well. Uh, you had mentioned a book, one of the best books that you've read, I think it was Reaching Out. Reaching Out, yep. Yeah, who is the author on that, if, if people would like to know? Dr. David W. Johnson. Okay. Yes, yeah, Reaching Out, and then the subtitle is Interpersonal Effectiveness and Self-Actualization, which is a lot. Interpersonal Effectiveness and Self-Actualization by Dr. David W. Johnson. I would say anything uh, past the seventh edition would be a, a good book to buy. It's not a cheap book, but, it, but it's a great book. You know, and you mentioned, you know, the part about some of these strategies professionally and personally, I always find this, if things aren't going well at work, we tend to drag it home. If things aren't going well at home, we tend to drag it to work. But now with the pandemic, for many of us, we're in the same place. So we are right there on the front lines, you know, whether it's with our kids or our significant other and sharing space and sharing technology. And my goodness, you know, you don't get that little break, you know, with the commuting time. And, you know, some people crave that, you know, they don't have to commute. And some people are, you know, kind of like that time to idle down on their way back. And, you know, in your own personality, whether you're an introvert or extrovert, or you need that kind of a social interaction that may be, you know, missing, you know, anything we can do with the technology to get those one-on-ones or to get those groups together makes a big difference so people don't feel isolated and all alone. Do you have any tips for supervisors and managers to help facilitate those conversations when they're not face-to-face, -face, they're remote? Other than buying some mints and frozen mints and having a risk of chipping a tooth. <laughs> you know, one of the things is to try to figure out what, what I call what or how questions. That, because there's no wrong answers to what or how questions. You provide people tremendous flexibility in how they respond. With a what question, you would get answers that are definitions or uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, exam 
not examples, but explanations uh, with how questions, you get descriptions and examples. So I would think about, you know, how could I ask questions that demonstrate acceptance? How can I ask questions that demonstrate cooperative intentions? So in those questions, you use we, us, our, so they feel like you're on, you know, the team. It's called the language of responsibility. Uh, sometimes we'll say, you know, I, I was thinking about how we could improve our communication with each other. And if, if you have, so you throw around I, me, you, us, our, sometimes it's the smallest word in the question or the conversation or sentence, but it has the greatest impact. If we were trying to solve a problem together, and I said, you know, and I run the show, and I say, I have an idea, this is what we're going to do. And we find out two months later it was a bad idea, and we get back together, and I say, wow, we really blew it, didn't we? And you're thinking, we? It was you, buddy. So that language <laughs> of responsibility, I, me, us, you, them, those. If we're very careful in the questions with acceptance and cooperative intentions, and to also uh, Self-disclose appropriately, which I think is empathy. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I felt similar to that. I was kind of shocked when that happened, or I missed that too. So really, when people do respond, to make sure it's always supportive communication by, by blending with their emotion, with this frustration, disappointment, concern, you know, or sad or whatever it might be. And then, you know, blend with that so they feel normal. Then they'll listen to maybe some options or possibilities and invite them into brainstorming some of those options and kind of melding them together to come up with something that you can both work with. And as you had mentioned, change in the contact center, I think uh, the contact center is probably being introduced to more different technologies than ever before. It's, a, it's an ongoing. I remember one time, past life, I was a controller for a printing company and we were purchased by Merrill Corporation out of St. Cloud and they came in and said, well, we have this automated way to do estimating hmm. and we're going to do it on a computer. And most of the people said, oh my God, this is taking us twice, three times as long. This is the stupidest idea. But a couple of the people that sat down and said, well, let's work through this. Let's communicate with our managers you know, of what the issues are having in the long run, you know, this is a strategy. So by embracing that, embracing the technologies initially in your job, I think it can help promote you. And, and some of those individuals actually got promoted, you know, to management because they embraced the change, they embraced that. Do you have any other advice for people that are getting changes, you know, in technology thrust upon them? You know, I mentioned a few times, you know, mastermind group or personal board of directors or role models. One of the things that I have always, you know, included is to reference out. Uh, I, I had a role model, I still do, you know, that I connect with in the speaking business uh, from when I started, who had a business model that mine turned out to be very similar to his. But there's a reason why I have a couple of thousand books in my personal library is because uh, not one size fits all. So uh, I do believe that reading, and uh, you don't have to read much, but just read something really does cause a different approach, a different oh, kind of a, um, understanding of what you're facing. So, you know, half price books, I would pick up any book uh, that I could on change, read a couple of pages a day but it, it kind of seems like it stimulates a different part of the brain that it kind of moves you away from being anxious to more energy and taking action. So I'm a big proponent of reading and that we should incorporate that. You know, one of the things that came up uh, with a client of mine last week was recalibrating our uh, work and life balance. And, you know, we identified there's about seven different areas of your life, you know, whether it's uh, exercise or, uh, your social life with uh, fam family life or financial life or, and uh, I should said, you know, one of the things I do is I, when I'm kind of struggling, I'll just pick out seven different areas within my home and I'll just spend five minutes a day, you know, thinking about or reading about those different things. But I change the environment and I change what I'm doing there. And, you know, depending on which one is out of balance, you know, over a period of time, I can adjust that, recalibrate that, spend more time in the areas that are worse off and not you know, maybe not any time on the areas that I really don't need to maintain, but 
I, I, the reading thing is, I think is important. You know, I remember one time going to a Brian Tracy presentation. He says, you know, a person that can read chooses not to read is no better than a person that can't read. And uh, it's always stuck in the back of my head. You know, I have the ability to read and interpret and take down notes and it's a working library. I can access that information and get unstuck. Take personal responsibility for that because uh, everybody else is struggling too. Everybody else is dealing with the change. And if you're relying on a manager or supervisor that's also going through transition to be accurate in their interpretation or perspective, well, that, that may not be the case. Yeah, I've also found and see if you agree, you know, some of the thought leaders like Simon Simic. I don't know if you've ever saw Simon Simic, a thought leader. And one of the things that he brought up recently was you know, a sales manager, and this could be any manager, comes to their employee kit and says, mm, you know, kit, you didn't make your numbers first quarter, second quarter. I don't know what's going to happen third quarter. And contrast that with the manager that comes to kit and says, you know, kit, you didn't make your numbers first, second quarter. What's going on in your life? You know, are there some things happening? And, and is there anything that I can help you with? You know, contrasting a great leader to someone, you know, using the old tactics of pressure and, ah, you might be out of here if you don't accomplish this. Yeah, yeah. my, uh, my presentation on leadership, I always say leadership is not just positional, it's personal. Uh, you need to know people before you can help them get from where they are to where they would like to be or need to be. And, you know, it's their responsibility, of course, but sometimes, you know, uh, people might be intimidated by your title. One of the things I've noticed is a barrier that has been somewhat removed for some people is when we do meet on Zoom, how um, much more uh, casual or comfortable people are to have uh, more, you know, uh, spicy conversations in a way, but uh, they're not as intimidated by the title or the office or the desk or the, you know, the environment. And so sometimes we'll have more open and honest conversations because of the technology. And then again, some people are intimidated by it and won't participate, but you know, you got to just kind of, you know, situational leadership, you know, are they competent and confident and a little bit more that we need to provide some training or a little bit more support for them emotionally. And sometimes both, sometimes neither one or the other, but yeah, we kind of have to be flexible. It's kind of like herding cats, you know, and making sure that everybody is in, in a good place personally and professionally. I agree. Yep. It's always the cats that get picked on, isn't it? Cats. <laughs> hey, well, I don't know if we, we have any other questions from anyone. Uh, no, today. I think that, uh, you know, as usual, when, uh, when Kit's speaking, it's a, it's a bit like uh, drinking out of the fire hose. Um, so uh, I think the main thing to remember is that uh, you can review uh, this presentation again. And, you know, Kit's read all these books and he distills all of that information. Uh, and so every slide is like, what was that? Oh, boom, boom, boom. Oh, wait, I need to, I, I need to look at that again. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, everybody has that available to them. And um, Kit, you know, thank, thank you so much for, uh, for your presentation today. We always love having you. Um, and if anybody has any questions, uh, please uh, raise your hand, and, but we will send out that link uh, soon to everybody. So. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you. It's always a pleasure working with all of you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, folks. We'll see you next time.